that, you know, as weird as this may sound, you can learn from an affair. You can learn what your spouse had with someone else. You could learn what dynamic that you experienced in that relationship that was missing in ours. That's one thing, but on the Ooh, I don't know side, if I could handle that. <laughs> yeah, but it's Hey guys, thank you so much for joining us today. I've got two incredible guests that have just done a remarkable job, created an incredible community where they're helping couples to improve their marriages. And specifically, they are helping couples to recover and restore their marriages, restore their relationships after infidelity. Danielle and Hassani, I feel like I know them because I watched so many of their videos and I just love their perspective because they really talk to both partners. So today, that's what we're gonna do. Specifically, however, today's episode is designed for the partner who has been betrayed and what things they can do, the stages of recovery and what they can do to, to assess the marriage, to figure out if this partnership can continue and what they need to do in order to take care of themselves perhaps, and to, to recover, maybe to recover the, the relationship, but specifically to take care of themselves. So without further ado, uh, Danielle and Hassani, thank you for joining us today. You two have four kids and you've been married for 20 years. Yes. yes. It's been a roller coaster ride. And um, <laughs> we're happy to say that we're at the top right now. So we're we know there's gonna be a dip somewhere, but we're prepared. Mm -hmm. <laughs> mm -hmm. But it's been an amazing journey uh, to where we are now. Well, I just feel really fortunate to have you both on. And um, you know, again, you guys have an academy, you do retreats, you really are are doing great work. I just can't say enough great things about the content that I've seen on YouTube. And um, I'm excited about this conversation. Can I ask to begin with what drew you specifically to helping couples to recover from infidelity? Well, for a number of years, we've been marriage coaches. And typically, the people we would work with were people who were having a few challenges and needed to get you know, course corrected so they can get on the same page and move forward. But when we relocated down to Atlanta, not that it was anything specific about Atlanta, particularly because we had a national brand, but we noticed that there was a high rate of people who were in crisis because of infidelity. And at that time, we did not know how to properly deal or address that particular issue. So we went and got further education, got trained and became infidelity recovery specialists. And so now 95% of the couples we work with are couples in crisis, those on the verge of divorce, those impacted by an affair who are trying to figure out how to get back on track. And so that's what we've done over the last decade now and have truly made an impact on couples all around the world. Yeah, absolutely. It's amazing. So let's talk about, if we can, um, the stages that someone can expect to experience when there is infidelity in their relationship and, and they're the person who's been betrayed hmm. well the, the first stage which everyone can relate to is what we call the discovery phase mm -hmm. so we've heard the term d-day that's discovery day and so this is where most couples get trapped and they could be trapped in this phase for days for weeks, for months. And unfortunately, if you don't have a willing participant for years. Mm -hmm. And so what happens is it's the most emotional, volatile stage of all of the stages. Yeah. And, you know, that's when a, there's a lot of ambivalence. So people are struggling and vacillating back and forth. Do I stay? Do I go? It's highly contentious. There's fuss and fight and screaming, cursing, yelling, yeah. breaking. All of that happens in that particular phase. Yeah, everybody has heard of PTSD. I don't think many mm -hmm. people recognize PISD as an actual serious crisis and serious matter. And Discovery Day is just that. It is post-infidelity stress disorder that takes over your life. And when we talk about discovery, you know, we compare it to the Hiroshima bomb that blew up all the people and the infrastructure of the world, which mm -hmm. of their world as they knew it, came crashing down. And you're left with all these pieces that you have to try to figure out how to pick up, right? You would never take a stone that has fallen and try to put it back on a broken wall, right? Mm -hmm. You have to demo it all, like literally start over. And so that's really probably the biggest step and the hardest hurdle for people to get over is that you've got to start from scratch. You've got to deal with the discovery and then crash it all down, start with a clean slate so that we can build something new. Yeah. 
So when you say um, that people might even stay in the stage for weeks, months, even years, mm -hmm. I assume then, or I guess it's safe to assume that the stage isn't something that you know what stage you're in based on the number of days or weeks that have passed. There's something going on in the relationship that means you've transitioned into the next phase, if you will. Well, yeah. So when people come to us and begin the process, we immediately transition them from the discovery phase into what we call full disclosure. Mm -hmm. Okay. And full disclosure is when you take time to have a comprehensive unpacking of all things concerning the affair. Because typically what happens is if I'm unfaithful to Danielle, she's going to have a thousand and one questions for me. And, you know, I'm going to engage, generally speaking, in what is called the trickle truth, where pieces of truth come out little by little by little. Why? Why am I lying? Why am I deceptive? Why do not do I not want to engage in the conversation? Well, number one, I'm, I am i don't want to cause further hurt and pain. Right. I've literally crushed her world, and now you want me to talk about the details? Right. And so to do that would be too painful. So to keep you from further pain, I'm going to ho hold on to the truth and, and carry it to the grave. Or number two, I fear the consequences of what may happen if the truth comes out. Well, what's that? The possibility that I may lose my marriage and lose my family and lose my reputation. Third reason why I don't want to have the conversation and I lie I'm trapped in between guilt and shame. Mm. You know, every time you bring it up, it forces me to remember what I did. And I don't want to be that guy. Mm. I don't even like that guy. Mm -hmm. And you bring it back to my remembrance and I just, I just can't deal with it anymore. Yeah. Or shame is every time I see you in rage or in tears, now I'm reminded of the pain I caused you and I feel bad for what I put you through. So to avoid guilt and shame, I'd rather Continue avoid life. the conversation yeah. altogether. And then fourth is... I'm just a compulsive liar and I lie about everything. And if I have to have another conversation, I'm going to be trapped in my lie. And now we're back to square one. Right. And I just want to add something that's really important here, that moving from the discovery stage to full disclosure is super important. But when that trickle truth is happening and they're just lying for all the reasons that he mentioned, you force your partner to be stuck in discovery mm. because they keep discovering things. And the last thing that you said, there's an inconsistency. And now you tell a different story because you're trickling out the truth. We never actually move to full disclosure, which is a very important step for healing. Well, and our, we're going to do a follow-up interview. So I want everybody to stay tuned, make sure that you are subscribed because today we're really focused on talking about the stages and the process for the partner who has been betrayed. Um, but this is a, a very different experience. And I think it's really important to understand what that looks like, even though you feel like that, you know, that person is the, the, the person who's the wrongdoer, and it's hard to have empathy for them. But until you really understand what the process looks like from their perspective, I would assume it's hard to come together. So with that in mind, the partner who's been betrayed, what does the disclosure phase look like for him or her? I mean, they don't have to disclose anything, really, do they? How is that phase different for them? Well, for them, they're, they're on the receiving end. Yeah. And so they want to know the truth. And so it's hard for a person to move forward if they don't have all the pieces to the puzzle to make sense of things. So mm -hmm. it could be, you know, th there's two types of people. Some people who have to know, they need to know every single detail. And what happens is they become uh, obsessive about the facts, obsessive about what they don't know, and they can't focus on anything other than the affair. And then others don't want to know anything. They rather stick their head in the sand, close their ears and their eyes and do away with it. They just want it to go away. Mm -hmm. and how so often, I'm curious, how often do you encounter in your work a partner who has been be betrayed who wants wants to know nothing? And what's it's, what's what's happening there? <laughs> it's it's a personality style issue, truly. It really is because there are one of I'm certified as an Enneagram personality specialist, and so that's one of the modalities that we use with our couples. And what I found found is that there are certain personality styles that have a tendency to just stick their head in the sand about things, and they just don't want to know. That's not the only determining factor. There are other determining factors that would cause someone to not want to know. But majorly, I find certain personality styles they would just rather move on. They don't want to dial into the details. They don't want to be hurt by what they already know. Sometimes they already know they have the suspicions, they have some, some proof, but they don't want to hear the truth from their partner. And it happens often. Mm, fascinating. Yeah. Okay. Here's, so here's a challenge. Let me just say yes. this. So if 
if the betrayed spouse has a feeling and even has evidence, I mean, evidence, sometimes they can't get closure until their spouse finally admits it. Yeah. And so this is why getting a counselor or someone who specializes in affair recovery is so critically important to guide that person through a process because sometimes you have to help them balance head and heart and make decisions that serve them rather than allowing them to make the decisions that set them back and sabotage their own journey of recovery. Mm -hmm. Does that make sense? Yeah. So, so it's important that we take them through that process where they get all the answers. So we encourage them. If you're the betrayed spouse, you want to ask every single question that you possibly can ask until you become empty. empty. Yeah. Right. There's no residue. There are no <laughs> questions lingering because once we have that conversation, we don't want to just have another conversation. We want it to be the final conversation. Right. So we can uh -huh. close that chapter and move yeah. on to something new, a new yeah. step. Because think about it. A lot of these couples have been talking about these things for years, yeah. right? Talking around these things and um, have known the truth about something. And the spouse has lied, 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 lied. And they know it's true. We just had um, a last chance weekend where couples came. And there was one really transformative uh, moment that happened where there was a lie that one of the husbands told. And the wife knew about it. She had facts and he had lied for like 10 years, okay? He actually admitted it in his full disclosure and she, it was almost like something left her body. It was the, the word she needed to hear so that she could move on. She said, now I knew it. Thank you for telling me. Thank you for being transparent. Now I can close this off in my life and move on. It's that important. And do you suspect in this particular case or in similar instances that the partner who is hiding that secret or, or holding on to that last little piece is it because again shame is it because they don't want to hurt their partner and they think they're all not going to be able to handle this all, all of it, the above all of the above all of the and above. then some no i've heard other i've heard people say that you know to continually ask for all those details um is to just continue just to torture yourself and that you should probably just talk generally about the affair, but you know, to know the specifics, like what day and time and where, and what was she wearing and what was he doing? Those kinds of things that it it's not helpful. And in well, your experience, mm -hmm. in your experience, have, have you ever, do you ever think there's a point at which, okay, yeah, we don't need to share all the details. I, I would say I'm the type of person that I don't know if I would need to know every single detail, time, position, all of that, but there are many people that need that. That's what they need for closure. And I think it's just an individual thing. Yeah. The, you know, as weird as this may sound, you can learn from an affair. You can learn what your spouse had with someone else. You could learn what dynamic that you experienced in that relationship that was missing in ours. That's one thing, but on the Ooh, flip I don't know side, if I could handle that. <laughs> yeah, but it's, I know, but, but, but th th that's one of the things that comes out of it. But on the flip side of that is, Wait a minute, you've been telling me this, but my records indicate that. When I look at phone records, when I look at credit card statements, it's just not lining up. You're mm -hmm. trying to convince me that one plus one is five, and that math doesn't make, make sense. One plus one is two. And until I know all the details, and I can dot every I and cross every T and close every loop, I'll be able to then move forward. But don't expect me to be able to move forward until I know. So once again, as Danielle is saying, it's a personality type. So our approach to the recovery process may be slightly different for one couple than it may be for another couple. Yeah, absolutely. We're talking about betrayal um, and specifically infidelity. But I would assume that a lot of what we're talking about, because you know, I'm, I'm listening to your the stages and as I watched your videos, I, I thought of how much of this related to the experience my husband and I had when I discovered um, his gambling and then needing to know every detail and, and also re-asking questions I'd already asked and you'd already given me the information because I was looking for inconsistencies. Mm -hmm. I was, you know, I, I, it wasn't that I was trying to catch him up. It was, I was trying to prove for myself that I wasn't stupid or foolish and that I was you know, asking the right questions repeatedly so that I could catch a red flag. So, and, and, and that's really what I, I needed him to continually answer those same questions over and over in order for me to rebuild trust. 
Absolutely. And that's a powerful thing to say, because the thing is, is that the unfaithful partner wants to quickly move past it. I mean, especially when they're going through a process like ours, where they're here to get fixed, right? They're here to get their marriage resolved, their issues resolved. What they seldom understand is that it is going to take time for your betrayed partner to regain trust. Trust is lost in buckets and gained in drops. And all mm. while, while you're gaining those drops, you're asking questions mm. because you're building out a map of truth and everything has to connect and make sense. And that's not something that can happen in a weekend. It's probably not something that can happen even in a year because there are circumstances that bring out situations that rise questions. It's almost, it's like a trigger, right? Because if you think about it, you move past the betrayal, mm -hmm. they're no longer betraying you, but situations arise that trigger mm -hmm. an emotion and an experience. And then you've got to go back to those there questions because you got to make sure you're not doing what you used to do because it reminds me of what you used to do. And the uh, the betrayed part, the um, unfaithful partner oftentimes just wants to quit talking about it, forget it and mm -hmm. move on as fast as possible. And it can't work that way. And, and let me piggyback mm -hmm. on that. Trust and triggers are the two areas to your point, which take the longest process in this entire journey yes. to heal and recover and be restored from. You can go through the other phases relatively in a shorter period of time, but that, to your point, takes time. Takes time. And every step that we take couples through is a trust-building opportunity. You gain a little bit more clarity, a little bit more closure, and a little bit more trust. Yeah. You get to the next step, then a little bit more clarity a little bit more close and a little bit more trust than the next step. Yeah. And so this is why, now let me just say this, overwhelmingly, uh, most people who experience infidelity don't divorce because of the affair. No. Nope. You know why they divorce? Because yeah. of how people uh, show up or refuse to show up after the discovery of the affair. Yeah. So it's just like after all we've been through and now we're going through this process and you're still showing up the same way, doing the same thing, still continuing to lie. You've given me no hope for a future. I can't do this anymore. I'm out. Yeah. Do you so happen to have um, statistics with regard to mm. the likelihood that a, a relationship is going to stay intact after infidelity? After recovery or after infidelity? Mm. Actually, after infidelity. Um, I don't have specific statistics That's on that. All, all I know is that based upon the hundreds or thousands of couples that we've worked with, you know, this may sound crazy, but in the last 10 years of working with couples with a fair recovery, when they go through our process, I think we've experienced about six divorces in 10 years. Wow. Wow. That's okay? amazing. And it sure. speaks to That's God's the, work. It yeah. is. Yeah. It's a comprehensive approach and it, and it requires time and it requires consistency and, and being committed to a path. So we're at that second phase. What comes after the full disclosure phase? Then, then what we need to do is protect the marriage from the affair ever happening again. One of the ways that we do that, we have to ensure that that relationship is over. You got to keep in mind, some of us came to us because of affairs that took place 10, 15 years ago, and they haven't healed from it yet. Some of us came to us because they just discovered the affair three days ago, and they're in crisis and emergency and need help now. And oftentimes, those doors are not closed, those windows are not sealed, and there's still connection, whether it be conversation, getting together, the relationship hasn't ended. So we walk them through a process where we completely cut off that existing relationship to prevent that from ever, you know, connecting again. Then we talk about establishing a code of ethics. Now, I want you to understand this. One of the keys to a successful relationship moving forward, you have to establish government in your home. Now, governments are comprised of laws. <laughs> laws are there for the safety and protection of its citizens. So if you have no laws, you have lawlessness. If you have lawlessness, you have anarchy. If you have anarchy, that means that anything goes. anything goes. So you have to establish parameters or rules or a code of ethics, a shared value system in terms of how you're going to live your life from this point forward. So there's no opportunity in the future for any inappropriate relationship to develop, which could ultimately lead to an affair. At what stage? So do you call this phase the protection phase? What do you call this phase, this third phase? Yeah, we're, we're calling it protecting the marriage from it protecting ever happening. Protecting the marriage. I mean, so at what, at what stage is there a decision to be made? Because I would assume 
you know, certainly for, for my own benefit, I, I made a decision before I confronted my husband about the gambling. Um, if he responded to it this way, I was leaving. If he responded mm -hmm. to it this way and at least tried and did the things that I needed him to do, then I would, I would stay and I would at least try to make it work. Um, so I'd kind of made that decision, but ultimately that decision, I didn't know whether it was going left or right until, mm -hmm. uh, the disclosure stage. And also for me, the ultimatum stage, I mean, I don't know, these are stages, but like until I gave him an ultimatum and I knew how he would respond. So we kind of had to reach a decision on what we were right. going to do. So where does that decision happen? Or is that throughout the process? That's a great, that's a great question. Uh, what I would say, and then you could be, yeah. that, there are three types of couples we work with. Couple number one, they both want the marriage. Couple number two, one wants it, one's unsure. Okay. Couple number three, one wants it, one absolutely does not. Yet and still, they all go through the process because they're willing to give it one last That's chance it. to see if it's possible. And in that process, they're able to gain understanding, have a breakthrough, find healing, find a recovery, mm -hmm. and they've made the decision to yeah. remain together. Uh, that was perfect. And the only thing I would add to it is that to answer your question, we don't have like a parachute plan in this process. Our process is like a funnel, right? And so you go through the funnel with what, what, whichever person you are. If you know that you want to stay, if you're not sure, or if you know one wants it and one doesn't, you're just going through the funnel, through the process, and the process helps them decide what they're going to do. After the process, there's the moving forward program because essentially you are anchored to all this pain, right? You come to us anchored to all this pain and you're circling all the pain. You come to us, we unanchor you from your pain and now you're sailing away in uncharted waters. So that's where it's scary because after you leave, like you have all this hope and you have a spark, but after you leave, you really need a captain to navigate you because even if you knew you wanted to stay, both of you wanted it. Once you get out there on your own, life hits you. Mm -hmm. right? Reality hits, home hits. So we carry them through and hold their hand after the process too. And those decisions are made along the way. When I work with the women, I work really hard to help them stand their ground, set their boundaries and learn self so that they can be a better partner in the marriage. But that husband has his part to play. Mm -hmm. Hassani works with the husband to make them become a better couple together. Mm -hmm. And our hope is that they can survive. Are there statistics or surprising things you can share with us with regard to um, men versus women and infidelity? In terms of, well, overwhelmingly in terms of, you know, who comes to us about 70%, I would say, of the couples uh, who seek some type of recovery, it was the the male who was unfaithful. About 30% uh, for, for us, it is the female. Mm -hmm. um, and so the way that men and women are wired, we're different. We, we have different emotions, different way of responding to things. And so even though we take them all through a similar process, the pain that a male, how he deals with his pain, mm -hmm. it could be tremendously different than the way a female does. Yeah. Another thing I've observed is that when men reach out to us, when it's the man calling, typically it's over. Typically the wife has packed up, moved out. There's a restraining order against him. Mm -hmm. He hasn't seen her in six months and he's calling to fix this marriage. Mm. Um, on the other side of it, the women who have been betrayed are the ones usually driving the repair, um, leading the way and restoring true. this marriage that they didn't break. And I think what's interesting about that, based upon what she just said, we discovered that men and women have different motivations. Women, generally speaking, are motivated by the hope of a future gain, a possible outcome. Okay. They're holding on for the potential of what can one day be. Men, on the other hand, are motivated by the fear of loss. So when a man feels like, oh, my God, I may lose my marriage and my family, that's when they shift into gears. And usually it's too late. Usually. So to your point, they're one foot out the door or they've already left and he's trying to get her back. And at that point, it's like they expect us to turn into a magician yeah. and perform magic tricks and so, yes, your relationship still can be restored, yeah. but it's a, it's a journey. And I got to say this. I, I got to speak for the women, though we, we, we support all. But women have so much emotional strength. 
And we tend to be able to carry a lot of burdens. And one thing that I've observed about us is that we can handle a lot of hurt and a lot of pain. And none of us really know when, when enough is enough. Like mm -hmm. literally it's one day that we snap and we're done. And when we're done, literally we're done, but we have this yeah. capacity to extend grace a very long time. Our friends, our family will say, what are you doing? You're crazy. And it doesn't matter when she has a heart for her husband, she's there, yeah. she'll go through anything. But when that runs out, when that grace runs out, it's very hard for us to get a woman back on board once it's out. Yeah. Mm, and, that and resentment. I, yeah, and I will yeah. also say there was a time in history where the assumption was if a woman ever cheated on a man, there's no way in the world that he would stay. That's and so today we realize that that is not the case not at, at all. all. And what happens is a lot of men feel like they're betraying themselves if they stay. I'm not a man if I stay because I society tells me I should leave. And, and, and they oftentimes truly love their spouse and wants this thing to work. They just struggle with the pain of what has happened and how can I begin to trust? And that's why this process we take them through is so critically important. Do you find that sometimes as uh, couples are working through this, that one is moving into a phase and another one is reluctantly stuck in the previous phase? Do you find that to be the case sometimes? Absolutely. Yes. And it's almost Quite like- often. Like that's, it's a timing issue because when you want it, I, I'm not into it. But then all of a sudden things shift when I feel like my partner is no longer waiting because she's waited so long and now she's done. Now I have the motivation and I want to step in and, and they're not in sync. And so they come to us oftentimes not in sync and it's, and it's our job to help get them in alignment so that they're both on the same page, going in the same direction, seeking the same outcome. Yes. And in oftentimes case, that's rooted in resentment, right? They're trying to punish their partner. So, you know, you're on board now. I'm going to torture you a little bit longer. I'm not going to be on board. And it's kind of like that back and forth because you're really trying to get back at them. Mm. And I can't imagine that's very helpful. In this uh, phase where we're protecting the marriage, what does this look like? You said for couples, it means creating kind of laws or as we call them yeah. in our marriage, personal policies. So we have like yeah. these personal mm -hmm. policies, things that we've totally agreed upon mm -hmm. that are, are right for us, that help us to feel secure and safe in our marriage. And I wonder when the betrayed spouse is in this stage, yeah. I assume that she's gonna set up some policies that feel very much like she's parenting or he is parenting the unfaithful spouse. Like, you know, he, our, our new policies are, you don't get a phone or are you, you know, I'm, I, I look at all of your text messages or we're sharing the same iCloud, like whatever it is. Talk to me about some ways that the, the betrayed spouse can enter into this phase of protecting the marriage without at the same time creating more distance between herself, distance and also shame between herself and the unfaithful partner. You use a great word, parenting. Um, one of the complaints of the unfaithful partner is just like, I feel like you're just trying to control me. Well, they've lost a sense of control when the unfaithful partner did what he or she did, and they're trying to get their control back. Yeah. And one way of doing it is by controlling the situation. This is why it's important that we focus on how do we create rules in terms of what happens outside our marriage and what happens within our marriage. So step number one, we need to have a conversation about this whole notion of opposite sex friends yeah. or opposite sex interactions. I think people get married with certain expectations or certain assumptions that were never really clarified. And so there's no code of ethics or conduct as it relates to members of the opposite sex. And so we, because you have to understand, there's been an evolution of infidelity. It once was very transactional, and now it's become very relational. And the two big milestones that have increased the rate of infidelity, number one, women entering into the workforce. So now men and women are in close proximity, working together every day. And then social media. I have instant access to whomever I want. And because of these two things, the interactions there. So it started off innocent, it was platonic, but somehow it became problematic and inappropriate. And now I find myself connected to someone that I didn't necessarily have a desire for. So we need to establish what are 
how are we going to interact with all members of the opposite mm -hmm. sex so that we don't portray each other? Yes. We don't undermine what we're trying to do. That's step one. And then step two, we have to work on the dynamics within the relationship, building a healthy foundation of shared rules and values that we there both subscribe to. There right? it is. Both yes. subscribe to. And it's not going to be easy for either one. It, it may feel initially like I'm being controlled, but at the end of the day, you have to make certain sacrifices if you truly value the marriage. And there's certain things you can no longer do. You have to rewrite the rules. That's right. And, and to your point, you mentioned, I think, sharing phones and having access to each other's social media and email and things of that nature. We've got to stand on transparency and what we call the policy of radical honesty, where openness and honesty is a part of our new norm yes. so that the trust isn't compromised. I mean, absolutely. Absolutely. The full disclosure continues after the intensive. You do not get to go into isolation. And so to me, that parenting piece it is what it is until you, as the unfaithful partner, lower your resistance and be open to sharing and the whole everything, your whole life. Hassani and I have access to our everything. Do I need to- Oh, I'm gonna, I'm gonna hold you guys for a second because I just got music coming through. Oh, I'm sorry. Oh, no worries. I'm sorry, go, go back. You said um, Hassani and I- I was just saying, I was saying sh Hassani and I have access to our everything. I mean, but do I need to look at it all the time? Never. I never need to look and check behind him because he has not betrayed the trust where I have to check behind him. But in the event that he did, and we were going through a process right now, I would need to see everything that's going on until I have rebuilt the trust. And so that parenting phase or that feeling of being parenting and controlled is just a part of the process that the unfaithful has to learn to deal with. It would seem that to me that in that uh, protect the marriage phase, I would assume that the partner who was unfaithful feels like, Psh, what rules do I get to make? You know, like, is what kinds of things can the unfaithful or should the unfaithful partner be able to express or ask for? Can I, can I jump in on this one? And then I'll figure back. Because <laughs> my, our Enneagram personality style uh, assessment, when we do that part, helping the couple understand who they are, but more importantly, why they do the things that they do, it really highlights their brokenness. And so in that process, they're able to understand where there are breaks in the hedges of their own lives, right? And so we actually work with them. They do have a tremendous amount of control about how they are going to now govern themselves, right? Mm -hmm. So if I, if you know that you're a loving person and you have issues with boundaries, saying no to people, and you're easily susceptible to someone making advances at you, there are certain boundaries specific to you that you need to put in place. That's where your power is in guarding yourself and guarding your marriage from ever allowing this to happen again. Yeah. Uh, you know, here's the deal. When an affair occurs, it exposes one of two things. Either number one, something that is going on or wrong within me or something that is going on or wrong in the relationship, right? So this is where we focus on the marital or relational recovery process. Now, at the end of the day, there were issues before the affair. The issues have been compounded since the affair. And what happens is if I'm the unfaithful partner, trust and believe there was hurt pain and brokenness within me that caused me to do it in the first place. Mm -hmm. Now, as a result of my actions, I've just created hurt, pain, and brokenness in my spouse. Now that she is going through what she's going through, she's going to project her hurt, pain, and brokenness back towards me. So yeah. oftentimes, there was an article I read some time ago. It was so powerful. And, and the question was, who's hurt more in the affair? the betrayed partner or the unfaithful partner, because the stuff that these unfaithful partners go through, the <laughs> hell, the torture, the misery, as we mentioned earlier, it's the most volatile phase. So a lot of times, okay, you hurt me, now I'm going to hurt you and I'm going to double down on your hurt. So it can become very physically violent, verbally, mm -hmm. emotionally abusive. I mean, we've seen some some very destructive things be done by the, un the betrayed spouse towards the unfaithful. So sure, establishing sure. rules for both in terms of how they need to conduct themselves is really important if they're going to have a long lasting, mutually beneficial relationship. And what, this stage where you're trying to protect the marriage, um, how long does that typically take? And is that 
and and what is the next phase that we would move into after we've kind of established these things that we both need in order to make certain that our our relationship it has this uh fortification around it if you will mm -hmm. kind of pr to protect us um mm -hmm. what's the next phase after that well protecting the marriage how long does that phase last it's not like it takes long it's establishing what the rules and the the guidelines are going to be it's just living them out consistently yeah. okay. but once you've done that then we want to transition them into what we call the path of true forgiveness yes the, mm. the reality is there's four different types of forgiveness okay you have number one the refusal to forgive we know what that yep. is but yep. then there's something called cheap forgiveness mm -hmm. and danielle was kind of alluding to it earlier where a person they just don't they don't want to deal with anything they want to stick their head in the sand and just move forward i don't want to talk about it that's problematic for two reasons. Number one, it doesn't create accountability for the unfaithful partner because we're not dealing with anything. We're not creating any checks and balances. Right. And it doesn't release the hurt and pain for the betrayed spouse because they're just moving forward and I forgive you. They're not leaving anything behind. They're carrying that pain with them everywhere they go. And it will, it will rear its ugly head, whether in an aggressive or passive aggressive way. That's cheap forgiveness. Okay. And then you have what is called acceptance. Acceptance is when you are working with an unwilling participant. So let's just say the uh, betrayed spouse is married to an unfaithful spouse who doesn't sow remorse. They're not repentant. They, they, they don't want to change. They're going to continue to do what they've always done. I've got to forgive you because I need to release the pain that I'm harboring by holding on to this resentment and bitterness. Yeah. So I'm forgiving you, not for you, but for me, right? The fourth type is what we call genuine forgiveness. Genuine forgiveness is when the unfaithful partner is repentant, wants to be held accountable, wants to go through a process of transformation, and now they're doing the work together, yes. which is the most ideal thing that a couple can do. Mm. I would that assume that, that that type of forgiveness, I'm just going to go on a limb here and guess that that couple has the greatest likelihood of success. Without a oh, shadow absolutely. of a doubt. And absolutely. I'm going to tell you why. Here's a statement, folks. If you're listening, you want to write this down. The key to your marital restoration is your personal transformation. Ooh. So when you become the best version of yourself, then your marriage will become yes. the number one beneficiary of your personal change. Yes. Like even in our struggle about year three, four into our relationship where we were just done, we were on the verge of divorce. We just didn't, we didn't like each other. There was no sex. There was no communication. You know, one month there were no lights. The next month there was no heat. The next, I mean, we were just going through. It was getting bad. It was getting bad. As long as we were trying to fix the relationship, yeah. indirectly we were trying to fix each other because mm -hmm. we made each other the reason why we were going through hell. Yeah. But it wasn't until we took a look at ourselves. When divorce was on the option, I made a decision that I wasn't going to divorce her. I was going to divorce me from myself. Mm -hmm. I was going to divorce myself from my from my horrible communication habits. I was going to divorce myself from my false perception of masculinity. I was going to divorce myself from my emotional reactions. And when I began to change within me, it shifted something in this relationship. It absolutely did, because I was able to see a difference in him that was believable. And I go back to recalling this moment where I hollered and screamed at the top of my lungs. And I said, you declitterize me. Ooh. And I meant that it's so horrible being in this relationship that I've literally lost all of my femininity. Mm. And it wasn't until I started to step away from blaming him and looking at what can I do to improve, that's when transformation came. Because we were not focused on each other. We were actually becoming better individuals. And it just rekindled everything else. And that's the hardest thing for people to grasp that they can actually get there, that you can actually revive the in love feeling. People can have no concept of that. They think that where they're at is where they're going to be because they're focused on doing this yeah. all the time. Hmm. Does that couple who one partner has no interest in changing or taking personal accountability or being remorseful, does that, does that relationship have a chance? Um, if they stay there, a, it has a chance, but it's going to be a hard road. It's going to be a slow process. And if someone is completely unre unrepentant and not willing to do anything, then at the end of the day, it will fizzle and fade, fade out. 
or maybe the marriage will remain, but it will remain in a stuck place. Now, let me just say mm -hmm. this. This is important for you to understand. There's a major difference between your marriage and your relationship. And I think people use the terms interchangeably as if they're the same thing and they are not. Your, your marriage really focuses on your partnership, right? So it's generating income for the household, managing the finances, parenting the children, taking care of the practical dutiful responsibilities of maintaining a home. And most men want to save the marriage, but they don't realize in order to do that, I've got to focus on the relationship mm. within the marriage. What's the relationship? That's companionship. That's effective communication, blending of personalities, meeting each other's emotional needs, sexual fulfillment, quality time. And most folks really use the words interchangeably and they, they've mistaken a great picture perfect marriage, money in the bank, beautiful home, kids are taken care of for a relationship, mm -hmm. which is horrible at best. And I, identifying the differences allows you to, to move along this recovery process. So for the betrayed spouse, we help them to understand those differences. And then we help them to see how is their partner showing up. Let's evaluate yes. how he or she is showing up to determine what path or course you should take. Yeah, and that goes back to your last question before. That's, that's, de that's decision-making time, right? So when you know this is brass tacks, this person has decided they're not gonna change, sometimes they tell them outright, I'm never going to change. I'm going to be unfaithful. I cannot have a closed, committed courtship or marriage with you. Well, now somebody has to draw a circle around their feet. Someone has to make a decision. Are you okay with that? Because guess what? It's 2021. And there are all kinds of relations out here. We're not here to judge. What are you going to do about it? And that's decision-making time. Yeah. So what is the, the phase after true forgiveness? Ah, that is when we begin restoring trust mm -hmm. and managing triggers. Yeah. Right. Mm -hmm. That long journey ahead. That's a long journey. So typically so this is the work, lots oh, yeah. of work done here. <laughs> and, and, and this is the challenge for the betrayed spouse, because oftentimes they feel like, well, why should I have to do all this work? I didn't put us in this situation. Why am I doing all this heavy lifting? And so unfortunately for some, they're waiting for their spouse to do everything. And the reality is both partners have a role to play. Mm -hmm. And I can't do your work and you can't do my work. We both have our individual journeys, but also collective. So if I'm the unfaithful person, I have to help go through my own process, but I also have to help my spouse heal who I caused the pain for in the first place. So I have a joint role. If you're the betrayed spouse, you have your daily work that you have to do to become the best version of yourself. And triggers is one of those things where when I first discovered I'm triggered 24 hours a day, everything is a trigger. If we're fighting, we're arguing, I'm crying, I'm in tears, I'm enraged. And over the course of time with work, those triggers dissipate little by little by little, but they're still there. So we walk couples through how to untrigger your partner, yeah. how to untrigger yourself, how to untrigger your environment in order to be able to function and manage in a healthy way. Yeah. Can you give us an example of uh, a trigger that maybe a couple you were working with was experiencing and how would you help them untrigger it? Mm. I have a perfect example. Yeah. So <clears throat> a spouse was unfaithful the unfaithful spouse would go to a particular restaurant. Mm. That restaurant now became a trigger. Yes. That was the restaurant that we used to go to when we were in a good place. And now you took her. Mm. And so they couldn't even drive down the street and they had to go another way to not be triggered. I think and I'd so have to burn the restaurant down. Yeah, Is that appropriate? So. Yes. Yeah, it's, yes. It's not an option. <laughs> and so this, you know, many of you may think, oh my God, you put them through this, but it actually worked. Yeah. We said, okay. If let's just say Applebee's is the trigger, I, I want you to drive to Applebee's and just sit in the parking lot. Just sit there for about 30 minutes and just assess how you feel. They did it. They left. They, they could barely function. I said, well, this time, but you know, go to Applebee's and just, just sit in the restaurant and just see how that feels. They did that. They left. We, we had not go back again. Yeah. Just, just go to the Applebee's and order an appetizer and assess your feelings. What we were trying to do is they had a high sensitivity to Applebee's. We, we had to help them redefine Applebee's. 
Applebee's is not yes. what got you here. Mm -hmm. Applebee's was one of the things that was attached to the bad behavior. So, so, so in essence, untriggering the environment allowed them to perceive and deal with Applebee's in a different way. Eventually, they began to eat at Applebee's and have yeah. dates at Applebee's because they they took the power away from that particular yeah. It's trigger. called time-lapse therapy. And this is used oftentimes with people who are struggling with P PTSD. But there are so many things that can be triggers. D-Day is trigger the day you discovered it. Every year, that's a trigger. You know, holidays can be a trigger if it involves family, knew about it, and maybe you didn't know, but the family knew. Now, whenever you get with family, it's a trigger. So how to deal with the triggers, it just depends on what the trigger is. Ultimately, we need the, the couple to create a new relationship with the experience so that when it comes around, they are not triggered. So we'll have them go to the place and create a new experience so that they can anchor their hearts and minds to the new experience and not to the affair. Mm. And I assume that this is a rather long stage for, for many. I mean, because okay. trust, as you said, is takes so much longer to build versus, yeah. you know, the, the destruction of trust, uh, which could be in, in a moment. So mm -hmm. after this stage, is there an additional stage? Yeah, there's a final stage, and that's rekindling the intimacy in the marriage. Now, when we say intimacy, most people think sex. No, intimacy simply means into me see. It's connecting with me in a multitude of ways. So there's four types of intimacy that represent oneness in a relationship. There's spiritual intimacy. There's emotional intimacy, there's intellectual intimacy, and then there's physical or sexual intimacy. Someone once said that sex without intimacy feels like rape. Mm. Like when two people come together and engage in sex, if there's no intimacy, all it is are two bodies just banging together. Mm -hmm. People who communicate with no intimacy, all it is is just words being tossed at one another, nothing's connecting. A couple who goes on a date with no intimacy is nothing more than two people in the same place at the same time doing the same thing, but there's no togetherness. Mm -hmm. So intimacy is the glue that binds you together. And with that, that's when we begin to work on the relationship within the marriage. All of the emotional needs that need to be identified and met in the couple allows them to build a healthy foundation yes. that is long lasting and sustainable. You mentioned that this is the stage where intimacy happen and happens, and obviously not just physical intimacy, but it brings up an important question. Is there a stage at which uh, you don't recommend couples who are trying to recover after an affair engage in physical intimacy? Well, yeah, so uh, that's a great question. I, I can jump, jump okay. on. <laughs> so what happens is when an affair takes place, yeah. sex can show up in different ways. Some become very highly sexual. They mm -hmm. overindulge themselves in sex because of how they're using it. Mm -hmm. They're using it as a way to feel loved. They're using it as a way to keep my partner from ever wanting to cheat again. Yeah. They're competing uh, against the affair partner mm -hmm. by performing sexually in the bedroom. And so that's a very unhealthy way of using sex. But then some go into a sexual drought and the relationship becomes asexual. Yeah. So we talk about sex after betrayal and what that should look like. Right, and so for both of those couples, a powerful exercise that scares, it's gonna scare at least one partner. <laughs> and that is we do what we, we're changing the term. We used to call it a sex fast. And now we're calling it an intimacy challenge because when we would say okay. sex fast, all the men were like, nope, oh, no, no, we're not doing this. And yeah. what it is essentially is that for both those who are in hyper sex drive and those who are in a drought, take a step back and focus on intimacy how things were or were supposed to be when you were dating, the tingle and sensation you could generate just by holding a hand, staring in each other's eyes, mm -hmm. having intimate conversation, hugging, kissing, being connecting, but no sex. And it's for 30 days. Ooh. <laughs> I know. And, and, and yeah, and there's some challenge. couples. They can't the make it. They can't ever make it through yeah, the 30 days. Yeah. It's, but then there's those couples that they're in what we call a sexless marriage. Right? That's true. So yeah. they're either only having sex once a month, sometimes 10 times a year. That's what a sexless marriage by definition is. But in some wow. rare cases, they haven't had sex for a year, two mm -hmm. years, 10 years, seven years. So 30 days, they're like, mm -hmm. 
Really? Yeah. So in that, that case, yeah, yeah, it wouldn't be great for them. Right. So mm -hmm. in that case, that focus on the intimacy is critically important because the touch that used to stimulate is now the touch that repels. Mm -hmm. So how do we get comfortable with just holding hands? Mm -hmm. And let's just let's get let's do that. How about how about this? Here's a challenge. Look into each other's eyes. Oh my God, that's you, a huge challenge. Do you know how so many people struggle with that? It's crazy. Yeah. They yeah. can't do it. Can't do it. Can't touch. Can't hold hands. Like just can't do it. So that's part of the, the process to help you yeah. to push you past your limits. We tell people all the time, get comfortable being uncomfortable. And now it's become a mantra because this thing is very uncomfortable until it becomes comfortable, until it's not. So that was the final stage. You said the um, rekindling of the intimacy um, and, th and then hopefully it's the happily ever after, right? Um, but this is a brand new relationship as you've described. It's starting fresh and I assume that because it's a brand new relationship that means what happened to the the relationship i thought i had where mm -hmm. does grief fit into this for mm -hmm. the betrayed partner i think it starts from the very beginning and transitions throughout all the phases what we've known is that there's some people who have instant grief and heartache but it's interesting we were working with a couple just a couple weeks ago uh, the, the, the male partner said, you know what, I, I just feel like I'm doing all the work. I'm the one hurting. I'm the one emotionally responding to this. And you just pick up and go like it was no big deal. And the partner said, well, you know what, I've had a tendency of just moving forward with things, but I, but I, but I feel hurt now. Like the affair happened like eight months ago. Now she's feeling it. It was a delayed reaction. Oh, sure. And, and, and think about when a person dies and you're one of the main individuals responsible for taking care of all of the all of the, uh, final, arrangements. the final arrangements yeah. you don't have time to grieve you're in work mode you're in get it done mode and then later on it just hits you mm -hmm. and it goes back to that timing piece that you mentioned earlier where one person's feeling one way the other person's feeling the other way and then there's a shift mm -hmm. and so this is why we do a a private marriage intensive or a last chance weekend but that ongoing continual support through the moving forward program is so critically important because you never know when it's going to hit one person versus the other and having a support system is what's really going to help you get through. Wow. Um, so I'd like to ask just a few questions if I can, again, thinking with regard to the partner who's been betrayed. What are some really important things that you, you just have to make sure you don't do this because it's not going to be good for you and it's not going to be good for the relationship? Anything come to mind? Revenge. Mm. Revenge is a big one. Um, just wanting the person to not only feel what you felt, but then wanting to know, what did you feel? Maybe I would like to step out. And um, it just opens up a big Pandora's box of destruction. Um, we've had couples that have said, you know what, I'm the hurt partner. And now I want to open marriage. We're going to do that now. And wow. it just invites more destruction. So that's a big that's one. That's a huge one. Yeah. Another one I would say is be careful who you share your situation with. I think let's often, talk about that. Oh, without a doubt. Yes. I, I, you know, here's the reality. Oftentimes we share our problems with people who share our problems. <laughs> so rather than going to people who have our answer or who represent our solution, we're going to the wrong ones. So you got to be careful who has access to your ear, like yeah, yeah. who's speaking into your life and yeah. are they poison for your relationship or are they protein? for your relationship. Yeah. yeah. Big, big, big. And situation. on that point, not telling your family until you have figured out how you want to move forward because you can't take it back. And yeah. your family is not so easy to forgive. They love you and they do not want anything horrible to happen to you. So you're telling them because you're in a lot of pain and they don't easily forgive. You've moved back in, you've reconciled and they're still stuck in the pain. So mm -hmm. it's really not great to tell your family until you know exactly what you're going to do. Well, one of our uh, moving forward members who who's a recent graduate said, you know what? Uh, no one in my family knows. And, and thank God for the community that I'm a part of because I found other sisters and brothers that I could share who understand my plight because they've gone through what I've gone through. And that community has kept us intact ever since. So everyone needs a release. You have to share. So and for hard. those who say nothing because they're trying to protect their partner, well, it can cause all other type of pain in the relationship. So there's got to be a safe community, an inner core that you can release to. And they're there to support, to protect, pray to help the guide to steer you in the process. And I assume we shouldn't assume that that is our 
core of friends because they're not trained professionals and they may have their own experiences or agendas, motives, et cetera. They might just not be as trustworthy as we need them to be. Mm-hmm. Having said that, I know a couple who um, the the woman in the relationship was the betrayed and she felt like for so many years she was kind of like protecting her husband and the kids really just thought he was the cat's meow and at mm-hmm. one point she and they were teenagers she just told all the kids what had happened kind of like to bring them down a notch and i i wonder what damage can be done or should children know when they're of a reasonable age that infidelity occurred in the relationship well, we, we, the number one rule we say is do your best to protect your children from your marriage. So a fair <laughs> or no fair, sometimes, you know, our, our children have a front row seat to our lives. Yes. And children will mirror what has been modeled for them. Yeah. And so whatever they see in that household, they're going to bring into it their adult relationships oftentimes. So if you can protect your children by not letting them know and speak more in a vague, general way, you know, mom and dad, we're just, you know, we're going through some challenges, but we're getting the help we need. We want to let you know that we love you, that you're not responsible. There's nothing you did wrong. But shielding them from those details is critically important. For some people, it's too late, right? Because our walls are made out of paper mache. (laughs) <laughs> and they can hear everything yeah, right. and we don't know how to stop. Mm-hmm. So, so in that situation, if you fight in front of your children, we think it's responsible to resolve the conflict and, and make up in front of your kids. And I'm going to tell you why. There are certain children who become adults, they're now in a marriage. All they have seen is mom and dad fight. So that's all they know. They never saw, I'm sorry. They never saw an apology. So they find it very difficult to form their lips to say, I'm sorry to their spouse. Then there's other children who have never seen their parents fight at all. So when the first argument happens in the marriage, they feel like the sky is falling down and it's devastation. So it's a fine balance. And so when couples come to us, we we ask, well, what do they know what have they seen let me help you have the appropriate conversation and steer it in the right way so it protects them and protects the marriage and you all are able to heal and remember children who do know they're hurting and oftentimes they have a double pain they because when you portray your spouse you're portraying your family so Mm -hmm. now the child looks at the, the the parent in a different light and they have their own pain but then they're carrying the pain of the betrayed uh, betray parent. Yeah. That's yeah. a double pain. So they need a recovery process just as much as the couple. Mm-hmm. So many in my audience asked this specific question, how do I get over this? It's been years and I just can't stop thinking about it. That was probably one of the number one questions I received. Yeah. Yeah. Well, I'll jump on it. It's it's about managing those triggers. You know, it's about learning and understanding what those triggers are and taking control over them. We think that triggers are something that's out of our control and that it's not, it's something that I'll never be able to get a grip on. The truth is, is that you have to learn how to govern those triggers until they become less um, authoritative in your life. And that's part of the process. We help people learn how to do that because essentially it's just your mind going on and on. There's a scripture that I'm always saying, I love it. And it's a scripture and I can't remember the verse, but it talks about casting down the imaginations that raise themselves up against the things of God. And so that tells us that we have the ability to capture those thoughts. So the thoughts that rise up in our mind, what we do is we play them as a video. And we watch them over and over again and we add to the story Mm. and we make it worse than what it is. And we close the loops that we never got answers to. Mm. What we need to do is turn that off. And that's like working a muscle, just like your arm has a muscle. We have to work the muscle of our mind, capture those thoughts, cast them down and change the thought to something else. It sounds simple, but that's literally how simple it is, but it's a lot harder than it sounds. We, We walk couples through a thought journal where we have them literally write down every negative thought they have about themselves, Mm -hmm. every negative thought they have about their spouse, every negative thought they have about their relationship, and every negative thought they have about the affair that took place. And to your point, we help them rewrite or to come up with a response to that negative thought. Because we think 50 to 60,000 thoughts a day, but there are those dominating thoughts that consume our minds. And those things that we think about oftentimes are cemented in our psyche. 
And now we have to uproot the story that we've been telling ourselves and retrain our brain in order to be able to move forward and heal. And that's that that's work, work we were talking about for the betrayed spouse that, that they need to engage in in order to be able to move forward. Mm, and we're going to talk specifically to the partner who was unfaithful and some of the things that they need to be aware of in terms of their own healing, right? And, and their own role in the recovery. But again, to take to answer a few more questions from the betrayed spouse, do you recommend individual therapy or marriage therapy after 100. an affair? Absolutely. Both. Both. Okay. And one of the things that we love to do is divide the partners. And this is the deal. People will get individual therapy and they're going over here. The husband's going here for therapy. The wife is going there for therapy. They're dealing with therapists that are self-empowerment specialists, you know, empower the women, empower the men, and they're not on the same page. What we like to do here at Couples Academy is bring the two together. So in addition to your therapy as a couple, you have individual therapy as a husband and a man, individual therapy as a woman and a wife, and bringing those things together, those two together, it empowers the couple. Now there's somebody working on both sides on both uh, on behalf of the couple. It's you, powerful. If, if I could say this, uh, overwhelmingly, a lot of the couples who come to us, they say, well, previous counseling didn't work. Yep. And I said, well, who did you go to? Well, I think she was a psychologist, or I think he was a psychiatrist, or I think they were a mental practitioner. They don't even specialize in this work. So they go. Mm -hmm. it's almost like I have a Lexus and something's wrong with my, my you know, my transmission, and I'm going to go to a Ford dealer to get them to fix my car. They're not qualified. They don't specialize in this work. Mm -hmm. So you have to find people who are qualified to deal with what you're dealing with. And to your point, and what's the goal? What's the goal? Don't you know that there are a lot of quote unquote marriage counselors that are not advocates of marriage? Yes. They After a session, they'll tell you yeah. leave, divorce, yes, move on. Because they've left. They've divorced. They're yes. on their third marriage. And so they're telling they're you human. They're human. They've they're come human. with their own frailties and their own experiences exactly. and their own uh, beliefs. Absolutely. So we, we focus on the goal. The goal is to reconcile this relationship. They both want that. That's what we focus on. We do it individually and collectively. Mm, I love that. Um, I've heard you say that to try, you don't try to commit, you, you, you just need to commit. Um, and I would assume for the partner who has been, maybe for both, um, you, at some point, you do just have to try because you don't know. But maybe there's a nuance there that I'm missing. Commit to the process, mm -hmm. right? So if I have been betrayed, the last thing I'm thinking about is trying to be committed to you because you caused this pain. So we say, no, commit to the process we take you through. And by going through these steps, it will be crystal clear what steps you should take next. You will see whether your partner is worthy to stay in a relationship with because they're making those changes, or you will see if you're signing up for more of the same. Mm -hmm. And then lastly, before I let you guys go, um, what about addiction? So I hear that there are couples who face infidelity and one partner has a sex mm -hmm. addiction, mm -hmm. or maybe they're using that as, um, I don't want to say an excuse, but maybe they don't really have a sex addiction. They just um, can't stay faithful, but it's not truly an addiction. So can you speak to that concept? I mean, yes. Yeah. Well, certainly there, there are addictions, whether it's sex, alcohol, drug, whatever the case may be, but then there are the hidden addictions that aren't necessarily sex, right? So I think what happens is practitioners and most people will say, well, if you've been unfaithful three times, you have a sex addiction. And but maybe they're addicted to newness, Maybe they're addicted to romance. Maybe they're addicted to attention that they no longer have because something shifted in the relationship. I mean, the in love feeling lasts for the first two years of most relationships. Mm -hmm. Then it kind of develops into a more mature love. So that high passion, intense, oh my God, butterfly feeling that goes away. But if my idea of love or idea of relationships is based upon a feeling when I lo no longer feel what I felt, I feel like I need to go out and mm -hmm. get that feeling again. So it may not be a sex addiction at all. It's another struggle that they mm -hmm. have and, it, and the, the relationship manifests in a sexual way. Does mm -hmm. that make sense? Yeah, so, absolutely. So and I can see how there would be those individuals who um, it's not even just maybe the newness that they're addicted to, but they have this belief that I'm a bad person who does bad things. And so I have to, when I start to feel good about myself, I've got to 
you know, mm -hmm. fulfill that belief, that negative belief yes. that I have. And I've got to go do something that's destructive because in my mind, I believe I'm a bad person who does bad things. That is a yes. fact. And this is why we help to work on the mindset. And this is why we also help people to get out of their guilt and shame, because if they're trapped in it and they have a permanent address, feeling guilty and full of shame, you we're not human doings, we're human beings, mm -hmm. right? But mm -hmm. what we do is an extension of who we are. So if I'm operating in a, a low negative emotional space, I'm going to continue to do bad things. When I, that's why we say the key to your marital restoration is your personal transformation. When I become a better version of myself, what I do is an extension of who yes. I have become. So that's why that individual work is so critically important. Mm -hmm. You've worked with so many couples and I know that you've had incredible success in transforming relationships and people. So leave us on a last note um, for, for the, that person who's listening, who, who has been betrayed. Mm -hmm. um, but they're at maybe the beginning of the journey and they've got a partner who's remorseful and mm. willing to work on it and willing to do the transformation. What is possible? Mm. Healing is possible. Fulfillment within the relationship is possible and having a new relationship. So the relationship, as you know, it for many couples is dead. And that's exactly what you want it to be mm. because you don't want to sign up for more of the same. Yeah. You want something new, you want something different, you want a healthy foundation. And what I would say is, it's important to have examples of couples who have overcome. Who do you listen to? You listen to people who have what you want and have been where you are. So if there's a couple who have overcome the pain of infidelity and they're in a healthy space, let that be the model for you. You need to create an idealized, version of the marriage that you ultimately want and then work like heck to get to that place. Yeah. And if it can be done for other people, then guess what? It can be done for you as well. Absolutely. I would just add, don't give up. Mm. You know, your, your pain is valid and you deserve to have a voice. You deserve to be heard. Your pain deserves to be heard and you can overcome. This is a process that um, many people have gone through come out on the other side and they cannot believe who they have become. And that's the key. You know, we're so focused on our partner, but it's about what you do with this pain. All of us have a story. We all have a journey. We've all come from someplace. We've all been through hurt. We've all been through pain. What are you going to do with this pain? Allow it to shape you and become a better person. Mm -hmm. Oh, that's powerful. Danielle and Hassani, where can people who would love your assistance, where can they learn more? You can simply go to our website at couplesacademy.org, that's O-R-G, to find out more about our products, our services, and how we can assist you in your journey. We also, of course, are on social media. We have a daily show. We're on twice a day. So you could follow us on our- Twice a day? <laughs> that's twice amazing. Day. Yeah. So, yeah. so you, you go live twice a day? Live every morning at 9 a.m. Eastern time and nine, I'm sorry, 9 30 a.m. Yeah, Eastern Eastern. time and 9 p.m. Eastern time. Wow, that is remarkable. Well, thank you so much for what you do. I'm really excited to have both of you back to speak specifically to the unfaithful partner. And ladies and gentlemen, be sure to, to give them a follow. Check them out on YouTube. Uh, go to the website, couplesacademy.org. Don't forget it's .org. And uh, drop a comment below. Let us know what you thought about this episode. And of course, if you're listening to this on a podcast and, and this was helpful to you, send it to somebody. Like there's somebody you know who needs this episode and it could really be the thing that helps them. So do them a favor. Sharing is caring. and Or you could leave a, a five-star review for this specific episode on whatever podcast app you're listening to. Uh, both of you, Danielle and Hassani, thank you so much for being here and thank you for the work that you do. Awesome. Thank you. Thank you.